Let's get into it. All right, tip number one, one route, one controller, one function. I'm sure you've all seen a route file that looks something like this. It looks like hot garbage. It makes me want to puke. Anytime I have to make a change, it's just ugly. And I'm sure you've all seen controllers that just go on for days and days in days. No one wants to work with that. No one wants to look at it and we can do better. We want to turn something like that to something like this. The details of what you're doing doesn't matter for this case. We're just looking at the overall architecture. Instead of having a route for every single possible thing you're doing, you can have one route for one entity and every action that happens to that entity can be then passed through one single route. We can have one route. It catches any HTTP method. So you can use get post, put, all of it in this one route. We want to identify the entity somehow, whether it's an ID or a stock keeping unit or whatever, some sort of way to identify the entity and then the action we're performing upon that entity. And then we're just going to call a controller. We're going to call no method, which means the invoke method is what's going to be called. Then we're going to pass whatever entity we have off to some sort of service and that service will perform some sort of work and return um, something back to the client. On the client side of things, we also have just one route. In this case, I have two routes, which now looking at it, I realize we can actually do better than that. So if we were to just call action, we can also get rid of this up here. So we can do action and then um, we can get rid of that. But now you'll see the git has not been declared or the data has not been declared. So we'll call data and we'll make it equal to a ref, which is a new way to make things reactive in view, view three, in this particular case, Nuxt. And then we will, um, if I can find my brackets without looking, then we will type hint that with the um, order response. And this is just a, you know, typical TypeScript uh, types. And in that way, we can only have one function. And this may give us problems because of the asynchronicity. But for right now, it's working. First method was find. If we do a refresh here and go to network find. And we'll see that this call is that call that we had in our routes. So we have server boss, an ID, and an action. We have server boss, an ID, and an action along with order. And if we do then pay, it's going to call that exact same thing, but the action has changed. Also, the method has changed. We can also cancel also going to be a post and action change there. And in this way, we can have one route and we can perform all of those actions on this entity without cluttering up everything and having a ton of routes. All right, tip number two, as I suspect it, we actually do have a problem with the asynchronicity here. So in the setup function um, or in the setup script, things are not working as expected and it's actually only loading sometimes, which is obviously not desirable. So I consult it with the view documentation so you don't have to. And if you want, you can actually use more than one script type on a component. You just have to make sure that the language is the same for both components. It must be the same. Then we can actually move this out of this setup script, which is causing problems. And we can move it into um, a normal uh, view script and export default. That way we can use, you know, those, um, those lifecycle functions, for example, mounted. And that way with the asynchronicity that we won't have problems. So if it's in the mounted, function, it will actually work just fine. And then we can stick to having one function. And let's see, now it's working like butter baby. Let's see, pay, got it, got it. Okay, now things are working as expected. So 
Tip number two, you can use more than one script type if necessary. I could have left that async function and there could be arguments for that. You could say, hey, what's the point? Now you've got two script tags instead of two functions. It's a valid argument. Either way will work and now you know how to do both. Tip number three, the enum shall set you free. So if you recall from our previous tip, we have this route and this route has different actions that it can process. An order can't process an unlimited amount of actions. There's only certain actions like pay, rebate, cancel, and so on and so forth. We can define those actions using an enum and we can also verify that the action given here is one of those available actions. So in the controller, we're, call, we're type hinting here a order action request and it's very similar. It's, in fact, it's exactly the same logic as a form request in Laravel, except instead of actually extending the form request, we have our own in implementation here. And you'll see that we here we have this order action, which is an enum. And this enum lists each case that is available on an order. Pay, find, cancel, and rebate. This is a backed enum, which means it, for each case, you have a corresponding string. You can also back it with ints. On enums, on every single enum, fresh out the box, you have try and try from available. If you call try from and you give you know a, a string, it will tell you whether or not there is a corresponding backed enum. And if there is, it will return it. If there's not, it will return null, which means we can use that to check if it is a valid action. And if it's not, we can just throw a, an exception. And we can say very clearly what it is. I'm sure you've experienced when uh, working on, you know, especially with foreign APIs, certainly not one that you have written, but that sometimes the you're not sure what the problem is. Somewhere down the line, there's a problem when the actual problem is in your request, but you don't know that because there wasn't proper validation being done. So this is one way that we can do that validation. So let's see it in action. If we make a call using find, for example, it will work just fine. Um, also with rebate, that will work just fine. And if we try something that doesn't exist, for example, blah, 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 then we'll see that this is not a valid action on an order action. Tip number four, who's the boss? If you're going to be a full stack developer, you're going to have to decide what logic goes where, where are things decided? And in this particular fake app that we're looking at, we have to decide, for example, which buttons are going to be shown. We could do that in the client or we could do that in the API. That's up to you. I would argue it's always a good idea, if possible, to do things like that on the API. And I'll tell you why. Imagine you have one API that is consumed by five different apps. So five different front end apps. The first one is an iOS app. The second one's an Android app. You have a React app. For whatever reason, you have a Vue app and so on and so forth. And they all use that API. Let's say for right now, anyone is allowed to cancel an order, but then the, the business says, you know what? We've had a lot of problems with people canceling orders that shouldn't. We only want this available for managers or let's say rebates. So here you see, once I pay the order, the only thing that is left to do is to cancel it. In this um, controller, if I go down to process the action and the action links, I see here, I didn't actually implement any sort of actually actual login here, but let's just say this manager is set to false and therefore they're not allowed to give rebates. Only managers are allowed to give rebates. And that sort of um, thing would have to be done five different times if you had five different apps. It decreases the chance that you're going to have unnecessary API calls when people, instead of, you're still gonna to have to do validation, but 
you won't have to be validating unnecessary calls. So if someone is the manager, for example, if that is true and they're allowed to do it, then that link will show up when it's paid. And the way that we implement that is by, you know, just simple checks in the back end on the API. And we only attach the link if the, the action is allowed to be done. We can look at what the actual responses are. If we say um, find, for example, we can see these are the action links and the corresponding URL, the method, and the action are all within the link that is given to you from the API. That way we can do such generic things like this, where I just got one call here and I can process all of the different actions on this entity as far as whether to render something or not. So should I be rendering this pay button? Should I not be rendering it? You don't have to decide that at all on the front end now. Now you can just say, if it's there, I'm going to render it. I'm letting the API decide whether or not I sh someone should be be allowed to perform an action or not. So if you if you looking at this all encompassing and, and you're a full stack developer and or let's say you're an architect and you're deciding upon these things, I think it is a very good idea to put that sort of logic in the API. I've seen it done both ways, um, and I really like the the method of putting those things in the API. Thank you very much for your attention. If you enjoyed it, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the bell if you want to make sure you're notified right away with, for the next video, and I'll see you in the next one.